Hello, and welcome back to the channel. This is part 5 of our series, on Lacey Peterson. In our last episode, we discussed Scott and Lacey's wedding, the family drama leading up to the big day, and the faithless betrayal Lacey discovered, just after the two were wed. If you haven't watched parts 1 through 4, get caught up here, or through the links in the description, to get filled in on the scandalous details before continuing on, to part 5. For those of you who are all caught up, you already know how Lacey discovered Scott's dark secret, and that he wasn't coming to live with her, in Prunedale. But before we go any further, we have a small correction to make about where Lacey was actually living, while Scott stayed in San Luis Obispo to finish his degree. Recently discovered through other research, we've learned that Lacey is actually listed on residence history, and her credit report, as having lived in Salinas, not Prunedale. Though the difference between the two is only about 7 miles, we thought we should mention it. And by the way, concerning some of these details that are a little harder to find, a large number of things discussed, and presented in this series, came from several fascinating books that have been written on the case. We've linked the books used in our research, as well as a couple of others on the topic that look like interesting reads, in the description. This case is so large, and at this point so dynamic, no one source could possibly cover all of the details. Lacey's mother's book is particularly moving and insightful, and if you like the investigative side of things, Matt Dalton's book might be a good pick. Anyway, if these are the type of details that fascinate you as well, these books, are on the must-read list. Let's get back to the story. So. Prunedale. Salinas. Either way, Scott wasn't interested. But it doesn't seem as though he was very upfront about his feelings. Scott spent weeks or months performing job searches, going on interviews, and even entertaining job offers in the Bay Area, as if he were on board with the move from San Luis Obispo. But then he would find fault with each prospect and keep searching. After he gave an untold number of reasons why the job, or the company, or the location, or the benefits, weren't going to work out for any of the opportunities that had come up, Scott finally gave up the gig and came clean, telling Lacey he didn't want to move. He told her he liked the college town, felt comfortable there, and didn't want to move away. Whether it was Prunedale or Salinas, Lacey was living alone, in a mobile home, with their dog, Mackenzie. While Scott was sharing a house with three other guys, near the Cal Poly campus. Lacey, had been living away from Scott for months, working her new job as a wine sales representative, and she seemed happy. For her, the only thing missing, was her husband. So when he told her he didn't want to move closer to the bay, she gave up her job, and moved back to San Luis Obispo, to be with him. They found another rental together near the city, and Lacey soon found a new job. She began working as an event coordinator for Sycamore Mineral Springs, the same venue where she and Scott were married the year before. She worked there for a while, but didn't find it to be much of a challenge, so she and Scott decided to open their own business together. After many months of research, planning, and gathering their assets to fund the venture, Scott and Lacey opened, the shack. The restaurant was located in a strip mall, but Lacey had the interior decorated with rustic elements, like wine barrels for planters and a handwritten, chalkboard menu that made the interior feel more intimate, but still casual. Scott proved himself to be rather resourceful and dedicated, while he and Lacey prepared to open the shack. Over the years, Scott picked up a lot of useful information that helped them in their new venture, not only from his father, Lee, who'd owned several successful businesses over the years, but from his old boss at the Pacific Cafe. Abbas Imani, who owned the successful seaside restaurant in Morro Bay, had not only given him advice, but helped him get connected with some used ovens, and other kitchen equipment. Scott was able to trim their budget a bit on the vents and fans they needed for the ovens as well. After having trouble finding a qualified contractor, to return an affordable bid for the work, Scott traveled to Los Angeles, where he took courses to complete the certification required, to install the ventilation in the kitchen, himself. These savings made their expenses to open the restaurant far more manageable, though Scott and Lacey still required a large amount of money to get up and running. It's been reported that Scott's parents, Jackie and Lee, loaned them the money to invest in the shack, however, other sources confirm that the venture was mainly funded by Scott himself. He'd sold his portion of the crating business he opened with his father just after starting college, in order to fund the restaurant. The shack opened for business in the spring of 1998, and it was an instant success with the college crowd. 
Lacey chose to name the former bakery The Shack, because she said it reminded her of dancing to the B-52's song Love Shack, at their wedding reception. Scott and Lacey put everything they had, financially and physically, into the shack and they ran the restaurant as a partnership. Scott manned the grill and took care of the books, while Lacey was the hostess and waited tables. She would create a special for the menu and a fun trivia question for the customers, every day. The two of them shared a love for food and people. They were both very social, and they both loved to entertain. The restaurant seemed to be a perfect fit for the young couple, and it thrived in the college town. Over the following year, the restaurant stayed busy, and so did Scott and Lacey. The shack was profitable, and running the business definitely provided the challenge Lacey was seeking when she left her job at Sycamore Springs, but the couple seemed to be working non-stop. And then, in early 1999, Lacey's grandmother passed away. At the time, her beloved grandfather, Papa, who had walked her down the aisle at her wedding the year before, was also having health issues. Losing her grandmother, and the risk of losing her grandfather soon as well, prompted Lacey to consider moving closer to her family. By the spring of 2000, she and Scott decided to sell the restaurant, and they'd made a decent profit. In June of that year, they packed up their rental in San Luis Obispo, and moved in with Lacey's mother, Sharon Rocha, and her longtime boyfriend, Ron Gransky, back in Modesto, where Lacey grew up. They lived with Ron and Sharon for about a month, before renting a small house just a few blocks away, on Scott Avenue. Soon after, Scott landed a job as a regional sales manager for the international agricultural company, Trade Corp., selling irrigation systems to commercial farms. He would start selling fertilizer the following year. Scott's job required him to travel, as his sales territory spanned several states, and it also required him to have an office, and a place to store product, near his home. Trade Corp. would eventually lease a small area for Scott to use for business in an industrial park, just a few miles from their home. Lacey went back to work in sales as well, for a wine distributor in the Modesto area, but she wasn't too thrilled with it. The job required her to stock cases of wine on the store shelves, and with her small frame, she would struggle to lift the heavy boxes. Although she hated the job, she stayed so that she and Scott could save for the down payment on a house. Although it's not clear what Lacey's yearly earnings were with the wine distributor, though the potential to generate a very lucrative income in the industry certainly exists, we do know that Scott's salary at Trade Corp. was somewhere in the range of $66,000 a year, plus benefits and bonuses. His salary alone would have provided a comfortable lifestyle for the two of them, even in California. For comparison, in the year 2000, Scott's $66,000 a year salary, would equate to around $114,000 a year, today. With both of them working, and the profit they'd acquired from the sale of the restaurant, it wasn't long at all before they had their down payment money for their first home. When they were ready, Sharon introduced the young home buyers to her friend and work colleague, Terry Western, who was a real estate agent. Sharon worked in the mortgage industry, and Terry was not only her friend and professional associate, she was also the mother of one of Lacey's best friends since grade school, Stacy. Terry was soon able to find the perfect house for Scott and Lacey. The small house in a quiet neighborhood should have been the perfect place to start a family. Though they'd purchased the house at 523 Covina Avenue at the end of the summer of 2000, they didn't take possession, finish closing, and move in until October. And of course, the first thing Scott and Lacey wanted to do was throw a housewarming party. They had big plans for updates and renovations, and as their family and friends toured their new home, the couple laid out their dreams and plans as they passed through each room. The front door would open into the dining room, where Lacey would set up their Christmas tree and gifts, next to the fireplace. To the right was a small sitting room that opened up with sliding doors to the fenced-in yard. Between the sliding doors and the sitting room, and their living room at the front of the house with a second fireplace, was the kitchen, Lacey's favorite room. Scott and Lacey were passionate about their food and their wine. They hung their pots and pans from the ceiling of their new kitchen, and they kept a good stock of their favorite selections of wine at the ready. After Lacey took a trip to Italy for a 10-day cooking course, we did say she was passionate about food. She began to keep a variety of specialty olive oils displayed on the counter as well. She'd said the trip was a highlight of her life, and she was extremely excited to start using the skills she'd learned there. Continuing with the tour, 
There were three bedrooms toward the back of the house, Scott and Lacey's room was painted a pale yellow, and had white Roman shades hung on the windows. Their master bedroom had a closet, but Lacey quickly filled it, and Scott would end up using the closet in the spare bedroom. There was a large pretty chandelier hung above their dining table, and candles lit on nearly every surface. Lacey told friends at the housewarming party that she would love to put in a set of French doors leading to the garden, and Scott told their guests about his desire to install a large barbecue grill out back. They were both thrilled to tell everyone about their plans to put in an in-ground swimming pool, as soon as possible. Lacey was even less patient to start planting flower beds and growing her new herb garden. She soon surrounded the courtyard path to their front door with beautiful fragrant jasmine, and of course, Scott's favorite. Roses. Just as they were getting comfortable in their new home, they were blessed with an inheritance from Lacey's recently departed grandmother's estate, totaling $160,000 in cash, along with another $100,000 worth of valuable jewelry. Scott and Lacey were off to a solid start in Modesto. Lacey's joyful demeanor at their housewarming party with their family and friends seemed like a perfect reflection of the couple's happiness. But it seems the cheerful smiles Lacey displayed all evening at the party may have been harder for her to maintain than her guests might have realized. That night, long after the little green ranch was empty of their family and friends, when it was just her, Scott, and the truth, the reality was, Lacey spent that night, alone, confused, and heartbroken. Her mother Sharon, who'd attended the party earlier that evening with a cheerful and happy Lacey, was surprised to receive another late-night call from her daughter. Lacey was distraught and sobbing heavily, just as she had been when she'd called her mom the night before her wedding to Scott, two years earlier. Lacey was upset about an announcement her brother made at the party. It wasn't bad news or anything negative. In fact, the news from her older brother Brent and his wife Rose, was wonderful. But it wasn't the information itself that had Lacey so upset, and she was overjoyed for her brother. Brent hadn't intended for anything to come out at the party, as he and his wife weren't quite ready to share their secret. But a friend of Sharon's prodded the couple, and she pressed them with questions about how long they were going to wait to have a baby. Brent finally relented and told her that Rose was in fact already pregnant. Lacey celebrated the news with Rose and Brent, but by the time she called her mother late that night, Lacey was alone and in pieces. The conversation her brother's baby announcement triggered between her and Scott had left her shattered. When Lacey began, she told her mother that while she was excited for her brother of course, she was upset that she and Scott weren't pregnant also. Her mother told her that a baby would come in time and that she and Scott were only a couple of years into the marriage. She reassured Lacey that there was plenty of time for a baby, but Lacey stopped her and corrected what she meant to say which is that she didn't think she and Scott would ever have a baby. Scott confessed to Lacey that night, after their guests had long since gone, that he wasn't just not ready to have children, but that he didn't think that he wanted children, at all. Sharon said she was shocked by Scott's confession about having children, and that she had no reason to think Scott wasn't interested in having kids, but then she explained that she couldn't recall him expressing anything other than stillness, when the topic of pregnancy and babies came up. She recalls Scott's silence as Lacey asked Sharon about morning sickness and other pregnancy issues during a visit the previous spring. Sharon said Scott would smile along with Lacey when she would bring up the topic of babies and pregnancy, but she never heard him speak about it. Lacey may or may not have known Scott wasn't ready to start planning a family, long before Brent and Rose ever made their impromptu announcement at the housewarming party. But her mother says she was certainly shocked and upset to hear Scott say very plainly, that he didn't think he wanted children, ever. Sharon said Lacey had always wanted to have a family, and while that may be true, there are other witnesses who've reported that neither Scott, nor Lacey, were interested in having children at a certain point in their relationship. There was definitely no denying that Sharon and Lacey had discussions about babies and children, recent discussions, in front of Scott, and while he'd never said he didn't want children, he never said he did, either. Either way, it appeared the big upset about having children, was over just as quickly as it began. Before Thanksgiving, just over a month after Lacey's tearful phone call, Sharon had another conversation with her daughter. Lacey casually mentioned that she planned to stop her birth control in the near future, because they now wanted to have a baby. Sharon's head was spinning, but Lacey seemed like it was the most natural thing in the world. Lacey said, we talked about it, and he said he wants kids. 
He said he's ready. Sharon then asked her. Are you sure? Not pushing too hard, or wanting to seem like she was questioning her judgment, or her decisions. And Lacey said, no no, we've talked about it, and he swears, he's ready. Sharon remembers being worried that Lacey would feel like she was badgering her, if she persisted with her questions, so she dropped the subject, and celebrated Lacey's happiness about trying for a baby soon. Never in a million years would she have imagined the nightmare, that may have been set into motion, by Lacey's dream to have Scott's baby. No normal thinking person could have. For Thanksgiving that year, Scott and Lacey visited Jackie and Lee, though we're not sure if they'd moved from Morro Bay to San Diego by this point, or sometime previously. They still saw Scott's parents often, they'd visited over that past Easter as well. Scott remained close with his father, as they had always been, and Lacey still spent quite a bit of time with Jackie during their visits and trips together, and she enjoyed some shared interests with her. They liked to browse for antiques and vintage kitchenware, and Lacey looked up to Jackie for being well-versed in the finer points of etiquette, such as setting a proper table. Even though they hit a bit of a rough patch when Jackie's rocky past came to the surface, Lacey seemed to try to bond with Jackie as much as she could, over the course of her marriage to Scott. The older Petersons tried to help the young couple here and there, when they were just starting out, at least they would, when it seemed like a good investment. While Lee and Jackie declined to loan Scott and Lacey money to open the shack, because Lee thought the restaurant industry was too risky, he and Jackie did give them a sizable amount of money to help with the down payment on the house. The $30,000 from Jackie and Lee was a gift, not a loan, and it helped them immensely when it came time to go house hunting. Thanksgiving of that year was also about the same time Lacey received her teaching certificate and was finally able to quit her job with the wine distributor. She began teaching as a substitute teacher nearly every day, often at her old junior high school, and it wasn't long before another Christmas was just around the corner. Another holiday season brought another major announcement, and another major milestone for Scott and Lacey both. While she'd hinted to her mother that she and Scott would be thinking about starting a family soon, they hadn't told anyone else about their plans. As their family and friends were gathered together for a Christmas party, Lacey announced that she planned to stop her birth control in hopes of conceiving a baby. Over the next year, Scott and Lacey both stayed busy. Lacey was still teaching every day, and Scott was working long hours, with a lot of travel for his job. Trade Corp is an international fertilizer and agricultural product supplier, headquartered in Spain. The territory Scott serviced included California, Arizona, and New Mexico. Scott was the West Coast sales manager and he was charged with expanding the company's U.S. market for their irrigation systems, chemical nutrients, and fertilizer products across all three states. The travel required was fairly extensive, and Scott was frequently away from home. It wasn't long before Scott was so busy, he began to inquire at Trade Corp about hiring some help with the West Coast market. While Lacey enjoyed teaching, she was still dreaming about some other ventures and businesses they might try their hand at, in Modesto. Lacey loved the idea of owning a little plant shop, growing, selling, and teaching about flowers and herbs. She also considered opening another restaurant, and she even created some mock menus to consider. Another idea was creating her own line of branded gourmet mustards, to sell to local retailers. And Lacey was teased a little by her girlfriends and they chuckled when she told them, she wanted to open an etiquette school for children. Lacey was still very social, and she reconnected with many of her old friends after moving back home. She and Scott would often host gourmet dinner parties, and after the pool was completed and Scott's barbecue was installed, pool parties for family and friends were a regular occurrence. Lacey and Scott also mixed in well in their neighborhood. Most of the neighbors in the area knew each other and were friendly. Of course, they would always wave and say hello but some of their neighbors had also had dinner there or attended parties and barbecues hosted by their young new neighbors. And Lacey in particular seemed to have a vested interest in the neighborhood. She joined and stayed active in the neighborhood watch program, and was always vigilant about what was happening on her street. One day, Lacey actually broke up a fight between two women, down the block from her home. She was also involved in the Encina Project, which was an initiative laid out by the city, to replenish native plants in the La Loma neighborhood, where Scott and Lacey lived. Lacey participated in a traffic study in the area as well, with the goal of improving the safety of pedestrians in the neighborhood, 
the project was somewhat involved and required capturing video for the research. Lacey's role as a responsible and diligent citizen didn't dissipate at the end of her block on Covina either. She was also known to confront transients in the park near her home, urging them to move along. East La Loma Park was along the direct route to the local rescue mission, and the homeless would often stop and take refuge there. One of Lacey's neighbors, a former Modesto prosecutor turned judge, recalled warning Lacey about the dangers of confronting people from the mission in the park, but Lacey was headstrong and continued to watch over her neighborhood, as well as the park at the end of her street. As the months passed, and the seasons changed, Scott and Lacey had become well entrenched in their community and their neighborhood. They knew their neighbors, their neighbors knew them, and they all looked out for each other. By the time the holiday season approached, Scott and Lacey were also well settled into their new home on Covina Avenue. They had ambitiously completed all of the major projects they'd envisioned for the house the previous fall, and looked forward to sharing their home for Christmas gatherings again this year. This holiday season, seems to have been a relatively quiet one for Lacey. She had spent every moment since her announcement the previous year, trying to conceive, with no luck. Brent, his wife Rose, and their new baby, celebrated the holidays with Scott and Lacey. But overall, it was a quiet Christmas. There were no joyous announcements, no life-changing moments and no extraordinarily special gifts, like Mackenzie. But there weren't any family blow-ups, marriages headed for divorce, or explosive arguments either. Though, there was one strange thing, that happened during this Christmas party. While Lacey was probably down about not being able to get pregnant over the entire past year, possibly thinking she might be showing off her new baby by this time, or at least be able to announce that she and Scott were expecting long before another Christmas arrived, Scott seems to have been experiencing a different spectrum of feelings. He made a comment, that he would later brush off as a joke, about Lacey's prospective pregnancy. He was speaking to Rose, and when the topic of Lacey having his baby came up, Scott said, I was kinda hoping for infertility. In retrospect, this could be nothing at all, or a sign of something much darker. What we know is that Rose, and any other family members who caught wind of Scott's comment, kept it to themselves. This includes Rose's husband, who is also Lacey's protective older brother, Brent. None of them took this comment seriously enough to bring it to Lacey as a concern, even knowing that they'd struggled for a year to conceive, and couldn't. This is either a sign that they all missed a pretty large red flag, or at least a concerning comment that Lacey should have been made aware of. Or it's a sign that it was, in fact, just a joke. Maybe a bad joke, maybe in poor taste, but isn't that what Christmas parties are for? Please post if you have thoughts on this. Do you think Scott crossed the line? Was this a slip on his part letting his true feelings show, or did he just mix a bad joke, with terrible timing? As the weather warmed, and the spring flowers were in bloom, you could find Lacey in her garden. She'd recently been battling a stubborn patch of grass that didn't seem to want to grow back, after the construction of their swimming pool. By the time her girlfriend dropped by for a visit, Lacey was working on pruning the bushes along the fence. After skipping over a long bare branch sticking out of the bush, her friend pointed out that Lacey had missed a branch while trimming. Lacey said she'd meant to leave the small branch there, that it was a perch, for her pet dragonfly. Her girlfriend giggled at her and told her how silly it was, to think of a dragonfly as a pet. Her friend listened skeptically while Lacey explained that the same dragonfly would come and sit on that perch, while she worked in the garden. She worked a while longer, careful not to clip the perch off of the shrub, while they caught up and chatted. Soon her friend watched incredulously as a dragonfly took its place on the perch and stayed there as the two of them finished their visit in the garden. Lacey told her girlfriend before she left that day, that for her, dragonflies had always been a sign of good luck. By the time Lacey celebrated her birthday that May, and there was still no sign of a pregnancy, she must have felt like she needed the luck of more than just one dragonfly. By then, Lacey tried all she could, aside from going for fertility testing, to make a baby with Scott. She was reading everything she could get her hands on, implementing every bit of advice she thought could help them conceive, and Scott was on call to perform. When the optimal time would arise, Lacey would call him home for an attempt, and he seemed to go whenever he possibly could, to do his part. It was already in her mind to go see a fertility doctor as well. She'd found some options for a specialist in her area, and she had been sifting through the results of her search since March. She just wasn't ready to commit to making the appointment, until now. 
On the 8th of June, Lacey threw a baby shower for her girlfriend Renee and hosted it at her home. There was no way Lacey was going to miss out on celebrating the joy of her friends, and her family, as they began to have children, and begin their families, even though she must have been feeling like she was spinning her wheels. But she wouldn't have to sit on the sidelines much longer, because the following morning, Lacey took a pregnancy test, and it was finally positive. At 7 o'clock that morning, she called her mother with the news. It was a Sunday, so when Lacey rang the house, she'd woken up Ron, who technically became the first person, probably aside from Scott, to hear about the baby. Sharon was thrilled for her daughter and the two made plans to visit for dinner that night. When Lacey and Scott showed up, Lacey was beaming, and talking a mile a minute. But Scott was off. He was almost sullen, which was out of character for Scott. He was even more quiet than usual, and obviously unhappy. Sharon finally asked what was wrong. Lacey told her that Scott was having a midlife crisis. He was upset over the idea of turning 30 and having a child. She implied that his morose demeanor was a result of his contemplation of those facts. Sharon told him jokingly that turning 30 was nothing, and to get over it. And she reminded him that having a baby was a wonderful thing, not a negative in his life. But Scott's mood never lifted and Sharon said he was stoic all evening. Lacey set her first prenatal appointment for the 11th of July. In the meantime, Scott had never been so busy at work, and he held his first interview for a position Trade Corp opened under his management. He met Mike Almasri for an interview in the middle of June, but ended up hiring Eric Olson as his only employee, about two weeks later. Eric was the representative for Southern California, Arizona, and Nevada, and worked out of his home office. He knew Scott was married and Lacey was pregnant, but he'd never met Lacey. Eric said Scott seemed excited about the pregnancy. Lacey's first appointment was mainly to confirm her positive pregnancy test. In order to be seen by this clinic, she had to have a positive from either a home test or a physician referral. There was no physician referral noted on Lacey's chart, nor was the date of Lacey's home pregnancy test recorded. We do know she called Sharon with the news on the 9th of June. These dates become increasingly important as the case progresses but don't worry, we'll recap when we get there. At this appointment, she was also scheduled for her 10-week sonogram on the 16th of July. Based on measurements from the sonogram on the 16th, Lacey's due date was set for February 10, 2003. Apparently the 10-week mark, with a window of around 5 days, is the most accurate time to record measurements from a sonogram. Her pregnancy was dated at 10 weeks and 1 day. When she got home from the doctor's office that day, Lacey made her first entry into her pregnancy diary. This is her mother Sharon, talking about the diary she never knew existed, and the entries in it that might give us some insight into the months leading up to her nightmare. You didn't know she kept a diary? No, I didn't. Did you read it? I did. What was, was that like for you? It was very telling. Um, I loved reading about how she felt about being pregnant. Hmm. Her little experiences of when she first felt the baby kick. The following entries are taken word for word from Lacey's diary. July 16th. Well, it's official. I am with child. Today, Scott and I had our first sonogram. The baby looked like a peanut. So small, with a strong heartbeat and active. She, he rolled over, kicked its arms and legs. I didn't realize a baby at 10 weeks would be so developed. My true feelings would be excitement and relief. I can't wait for the changes to come. July 25th. Today I realize that I can no longer fit into a pair of pants that I love. My tummy is getting bigger and I have a hard time sucking it in. I'm still real sleepy, but my headaches aren't as bad. I had to buy a new bra this week, and I know a new wardrobe is on its way sooner than I thought. August 15th. On my way to the mall I had a big sneeze, and a few seconds later I felt something that I had been waiting for. I felt the baby move. It was such a small flutter on the right side of my stomach. I have been reading about what the first movements would feel like, but I didn't expect it so soon. I'm only 14 weeks pregnant, but my body is starting to show signs that I am pregnant to everyone else. The 20th of August was Lacey's next prenatal appointment, and Scott accompanied his wife to the doctor's office. 
Lacey told the doctor she was concerned about pressure in her lower abdomen. She had previously had surgery on her cervix and was concerned about losing the baby. Dr. Adraki performed an ultrasound to determine if her cervix was strong enough. The exam revealed she was fine. Scott was with Lacey both in the office portion and during the ultrasound. Adraki said Lacey appeared happy about the baby and never observed anything negative about Scott. Dr. Adraki said that any negative feedback from the husband is always noted on the patient's chart, and no such notations were made by any of the staff concerning Scott. It was a routine appointment, and the doctor marked the baby's gestational age at 15 weeks and one day. Lacey made another entry into her diary after she and Scott visited the doctor. August 20th. We heard the baby's heartbeat today. The doctor had to chase the baby around with the machine but she finally cornered her or him. The heartbeat was strong and loud. It's amazing to have a living human inside of me. I can't wait to meet her or him. It was around this time Sharon had a dark premonition about Lacey and the baby. She shared it with her cousin Gwen, who was more like her best friend than a cousin, but she hadn't told another living soul about her strange feeling, not even Ron. Sharon told Gwen she'd gotten an overwhelming sense that something would happen to Lacey, and that she wouldn't survive her pregnancy. Sharon tried to cling to logic, knowing that there was no reason to think her daughter was in any danger. Lacey was perfectly healthy, and so was the baby, it was nonsensical to feed into what amounted to be nothing more than a crazy feeling, but, of course, looking back, Sharon's premonition, made all the sense in the world. Lacey was growing a little each week, and she spent the afternoon of August 30th replenishing some of her wardrobe. She picked up a few outfits from motherhood maternity, including some pieces she could wear to work, or dress up a bit if she needed to. A few days later, she made another entry in her diary. September 5th. The second trimester is great. I have so much energy and I feel like my old self again, except for the extra 10 pounds. I am wearing my maternity clothes now. My tummy is growing a little each day, and my bathroom trips are less frequent. I'm 17 and a half weeks and the countdown has begun until my next doctor's visit. At that appointment, we will find out the sex of our child. On September 24th, Lacey had another sonogram. Based on these measurements, the due date changed in her chart from the 10th of February to the 16th. The 20-week sonogram has a window of plus or minus 10 days in relation to its accuracy. Based on the 20-week sonogram, the baby would have been 19 and 2 7th weeks gestational age. Going by the 10-week sonogram from July 16th, the baby would have been 20 weeks and 1 day. We mention it because again, it becomes relevant later. At this appointment, Scott and Lacey also learned the sex of their baby, but I'll let Lacey tell you. When they got home from the doctor's office, she made another diary entry. September 24th. I am 20 weeks pregnant, and my tummy is finally bulging out. Today we had another sonogram, and we were able to find out the sex of our child. It's a boy. We were excited to know the sex of our child. It makes our pregnancy even more realistic. Now we need to focus on names and decorating the nursery. Scott worked to convert the spare bedroom into a nursery. Family friend Guy Milagy said, he put a lot of hours into making that baby room just right. He was real excited about having his first child. He talked about that all the time. Scott and Lacey decorated the baby's room in a nautical theme, with blue walls and a life preserver stenciled with the words, Welcome aboard. While September may have been centered around their new baby boy, once October rolled around, Lacey's focus shifted to Scott. His 30th birthday was fast approaching, and Lacey wanted to do something extraordinary for him. She continued to try to get him to confirm a date with her, so she could plan a surprise event for him on the 24th, but he would never settle on a solid date for her to plan around. Scott ended up being out of town at a convention in Anaheim on the 24th, his actual birthday, but Lacey still managed to throw him a pretty impressive dinner party. She'd planned a multiple-course gourmet meal for themselves and six other couples, serving all of his favorites with all the extras and trimmings, and as far as we know, there was no more talk of a midlife crisis as his 30th birthday came and went. A few days later, on the 29th of October, Lacey had another visit with her doctor. The office call was uneventful, but the nurse made a note on Lacey's chart that she was concerned about weight gain. 
Lacey made another diary entry when she returned home that day. October 29th. The baby has been moving a lot lately. It feels like little punches. Sometimes they're big enough to move my hand if it's placed on my tummy. Today we had an appointment or a checkup for a better word. Scott and I heard the baby's heartbeat, and the doctor said it sounded normal. The doctor asked if Scott had felt the baby move yet and he excitedly replied, yes. October 27th, Scott felt the baby move for the first time. We were at the Tomlinson's watching Game 7 of the World Series between the Angels and the Giants. I felt relieved because I didn't want to be the only one experiencing such a beautiful moment. Now Scott in my mind can enjoy my or our pregnancy even more now. Scott didn't show a whole lot of excitement, but I know he really was. Toward the end of October, Lacey started to notice some issues with dizziness while exercising. Lacey stayed active both before and during her pregnancy. She walked frequently, multiple times a week, completing a loop in the area around their Covina home that was roughly a mile long. Her mother often walked with her along her route. Though it was a bit farther than their rental house on Scott Avenue that had been just a few blocks away, Sharon and Ron still lived rather close, and they would often share walks together host one another for dinners, and watch TV together frequently. In fact, Scott began to encourage more family time together during Lacey's pregnancy. He said it would be good for the baby, if they all had more time together, and a close relationship with his grandparents. So, while Scott would often walk Lacey's mile with her, her mother Sharon walked with Lacey frequently as well, and she said Lacey kept a good pace. Other days, Lacey would walk her loop alone, or she would take Mackenzie with her. Mackenzie was a big dog, a golden retriever, about two years old, and he was a bit unruly. He didn't have good leash manners and he would pull Lacey's small frame around a bit when she tried to walk him. It was said that Lacey didn't walk Mackenzie. Mackenzie walked Lacey. He may not have had the best manners, but Mackenzie was known to be protective of Lacey so she took him on walks with her often. One day, while on her walk through East La Loma Park, she got extremely dizzy, vomited, and had to sit down in the grass to rest. Lacey was embarrassed because the maintenance workers in the park saw her get sick. Sharon advised her to call the doctor, but Lacey said it wasn't a big deal, and didn't make the call. But Sharon said she did ask her to do her the favor of carrying her phone on her walks from then on. Lacey promised to bring her cell phone with her on her walks, though we're not sure if she followed through with this. Most evidence points away from her making a habit of taking the phone along on her walks. A few days later it happened again. In the park, she got so dizzy she thought she'd fall if she didn't sit down, but this time she didn't vomit. She did need to sit there for several minutes before feeling well enough to make her way home though. She didn't call Sharon, indeed we don't know if she even took the phone with her but if she did, she didn't use it to call for help, or a ride home. The second dizzy spell did, however, cause Lacey to call her doctor. We'll examine more of the doctor's advice in a later episode, but for now, the doctor told her she could be dehydrated. The doctor also said if she was going to take walks, she should do it later in the day, when her body has more time to become more hydrated. Her mother has said that the doctor told Lacey not to walk at all, and to take it easy, because she was getting close to her due date. But Lacey wasn't really too terribly close to her due date. At this point, she had over three months to go. And it seems too then, that the doctor is giving somewhat conflicting advice, Either take it easy and don't walk at all anymore, because you're close to your due date, or walk later in the morning so you can get more hydrated before you exercise. So, which is it? Did the doctor tell her to stop walking? If that's the case, did Lacey comply with the doctor's wishes? And why is it so important? We'll answer all of these questions, and more, in future episodes, so don't forget to subscribe. In early November, Lacey joined Village Yoga. Some, including her mother, say this is further proof that Lacey stopped her walks, saying she had opted for yoga sessions in place of her 40-minute circuit through East La Loma Park. How effective is 40 minutes of a brisk pace walking versus a 40-minute session of yoga, at maintaining weight loss? Let us know your opinions on whether or not you think Lacey kept walking regularly in her later stages of pregnancy as well. Scott says yes, but her mother, says no. Sharon says Lacey stopped walking in October, and replaced it with her classes, at Village Yoga. What do you guys think? On the 14th of November, Lacey made another diary entry. 
November 14. My little baby boy is growing every day. It seems like every morning I wake up and my belly seems bigger. I love feeling him move inside of me. We've decided to name him Connor Latham Peterson. I enjoy talking to him and rubbing my tummy to let him know I'm thinking about him. Pregnancy is such a wonderful experience. By the time mid-November rolled around, Lacey and Scott began to make plans for the holidays. Their routine was to alternate between their sets of parents for Thanksgiving and Christmas. They had spent the previous Thanksgiving with Sharon and Ron in Modesto and for Christmas, they had traveled to San Diego to spend it with Scott's parents, Jackie and Lee. This year, the plan would be to go to San Diego for Thanksgiving, and spend Christmas in Modesto with Sharon and Ron. But the end of November would turn out to be a mad scramble of travel for Scott and Lacey when Scott's older adopted sister, who had just been reunited with the family after three decades a couple of years prior, made a plan to tack a trip to Disney onto their visit to San Diego for Thanksgiving. Lacey also had her baby shower to attend that Scott's family had planned for her while they were in town for the holiday. In some versions of this story, Jackie gets a large portion of the blame for the timing of the trip, with many asking why the family would plan a trip to Disney, with so much added stress and walking, especially if they knew Lacey'd been struggling with dizzy spells. And though many people say, the answer is apparently Jackie. Though this makes little sense, for a few different reasons. Apparently, the reason for the trip was that Scott's mother Jackie, wanted to see him be able to enjoy a trip to Disney, because he'd never been before, but that's not accurate either because Scott, had indeed, already been to Disney as a little boy. Reason number two is that it's weird and random. Scott saw his parents roughly 10 to 14 times every year, be it for holidays, fishing trips, birthdays and sometimes just to visit and play a game of golf with his dad. Jackie could have planned a Disney trip at any time over the years, that is, if she was really interested in taking her middle-aged son to Magic Kingdom in the first place because that, in itself, is kinda weird. And then, lastly, Scott's adopted sister Anne, essentially says that it was her idea to take the trip, which is also kinda silly because she has a small infant and a toddler at the time, though it makes more sense than wanting to take them when they're 30, so there's that. And yes, this is the same sister that turned down Scott and Lacey's wedding invitation, allegedly saying she wouldn't go because she wanted nothing to do with her birth mother Jackie or her family. So as Scott and Lacey prepared to go to Disneyland in Anaheim, and then Thanksgiving and a baby shower in San Diego with the Petersons, Lacey looked forward to seeing everyone, but she may have been feeling pretty exhausted from her pregnancy by this point. A bit of evidence for this is the fact that Scott rented a wheelchair for Lacey while they visited the theme park. Some reports say he pushed Lacey through the park the entire day, while others say her use of the chair was minimal, and maybe either rented as a precaution, or even as a joke. At this point, Lacey would have been roughly six and a half months pregnant, but it was only weeks after her calls to the doctor complaining of dizzy spells and shortness of breath on the 6th and 8th of November. How heavily Lacey relied on the wheelchair at Disney, is unclear, but there are some other interesting details that arise during their trip, that are certainly worth mentioning. Including an outburst directed at Lacey over the dinner table, from Jackie. And some outwardly rude and somewhat suspicious behavior from Scott, that we'll discuss in our next episode. Join us next time as Scott's long-lost sister comes back into the picture as well, just in time to tell us all the juicy gossip, about the Petersons. Don't forget to subscribe, so you don't miss what Lacey wrote in her pregnancy diary during the month of December, and find out why she made several trips to the jewelers and a local pawn shop, just before Christmas. We'll tag along with Scott and Lacey to a couple more family dinners with Ron and Sharon, and an annual out-of-town trip to Carmel before the holiday they'd taken with Jackie and Lee. We'll talk about Scott's country club membership, his sailing trip with friends over an early December weekend, and of course, his decision to buy a boat, soon after. And then we'll discuss the moment everything, came crashing down. Scott's sister-in-law, Janie, and his father Lee, described getting a call from Scott, that would change all their lives, forever. We got the phone call and Scott was really hard to understand. Jackie told me that she thought he had said she miscarried, and mm -hmm. so so he was really just, you know, terribly upset. You know, he was still just uh, disbelieving. We were standing in our bedroom, and I 
I could only hear Joe's end of the conversation. Um, but pretty much all he said is, I'm coming, brother. Christmas of 2002 quickly unraveled into a nightmare. It was every Christmas Eve. We always just revel in the fact that how wonderful our, our kids were and, and uh, how lucky we were. And so grateful, so feeling so blessed to, to have such a family. And, and now we're gonna have another grandson. And, um, of course, and then the next morning it was all shattered. Thanks for listening. If you liked the episode, please let us know by giving it a like. And if you want to hear more stories like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell to be notified when we post new content. Stay safe, be kind, and until next time, Memento.